Hello everyone. Is this on? Is it on? Have we have we transitioned over? Yes, we have. Okay then. Um hello all. That was a very untheatrical beginning, wasn't it? Um let me bring up the thing on here. Yeah, hi. Um first of all, apologies for being a little bit late. We're about a minute late getting started on this in the spirit of transparency and honesty that I hope to communicate through the course of this uh, maybe an hour together. Um, I went for a pee. But I'm back now. I have my, oh no, that's not my water. I have my water. I have my green tea. I have my webcam. I have my laptop. More importantly, I have you. So how is everyone? Who have we got watching? We've got um, Megan Moore. Hi, Myra. Drag queen from Denmark here. Huge fan. Oh, thank you, Megan. Uh, Gareth Denny. Hello, Gareth. Maya V. That reminds me of the... Do you remember that song that was in Spanish not so long ago? It went like, Maya he, Maya ha, Maya ha ha. I don't speak Spanish, but, um, you know, something like that. Colin Bell. Hello, Colin. I can always tell when the delay catches up with everyone else because that's when everyone starts talking. Hi, James Masterman. Hello from Manchester. Lots of A's on the end there. Louis Tyree says, good evening, Gareth slash Myra. Well, what a good, what a good moment to bring that up, Louis, because uh, there's no Myra here tonight. She is locked away. She, if, if throughout the evening, if you're quiet, you'll be able to hear the uh, faint scratching, maybe even the occasional scream. Uh, that's Myra from her um, confinement, scratching away like Yvonne Atkins. Little football, no, not footballers' wives. Bad girls reference there for you. For anyone that remembers the noughties. Um, celebrity Santa's watching. I didn't know there was any other kind of Santa. You don't have Santa in obscurity, do you? Bradley Gull. Hello, Gareth. Watching from Southend-on-Sea with my friend Nathan. Ah, oh, Dan Dainter's watching. Um... For those who may watch Myra's streams and occasionally hear Myra refer to Diane Dainter, Dan Dainter works at the Carriage Theatre, Carriage Works Theatre in Leeds, amongst other places. And he had the delight and joy of uh, working backstage with um, Myra Dubois in not many pantomime productions, in two pantomime productions there. Hey, Emma Gibson. Evening, Gareth. Is Myra in the cupboard with Liza? Very good. Very good, Emma Gibson. Occasionally, I notice something with uh, Myra's followers that uh, you, you have a little pissing competition with each other, don't you, to see who listens the carefulest, and you'll reference something. And sometimes it's something I've even forgotten that she said, but you reference it, and, uh, <laughs> and it does make me laugh. Anyway, we've checked in with everyone. Um, just to sort of, before we get started, we've done a little bit of waffle as people are watching. Um... I just want to keep things informal. I had an idea to do something like this uh, during the first lockdown about 10 years ago when I was on the internet myself. Now, you might not know this about me, but here comes your first little bit of backstage um, gossip. Backstage gossip? Tidbit? I don't know. Um, I'm a huge fan of ventriloquism and I love puppets, I love dummies. If you have been following Myra's career for long enough, you will remember when she actually had a ventriloquist dummy uh, called Edward. Little uh, Edward the Magical Mute, he was called, because he couldn't talk, which is handy in a ventriloquist act. And, uh, and I love ventriloquism. Anyway, a ventriloquist uh, puppet maker whose work I admire greatly. That should give you a little indication about how tonight's going to go, by the way. I will say things like, a puppet maker who I admire greatly. So if you were wait, uh, coming on here and you were expecting me to a bit, bit like, you know, yeah, fierce, the tea girl slay. I'm afraid it's going to be a little bit more BBC4 than that. But anyway, a puppet maker who I admire was doing something like this. He just had Instagram rolling and, uh, oh, checking the current uh, curator. These aren't actually curated titles. I considered curating the bookshelf into something amusing, but I didn't get the chance uh, because, uh, I'll, as I was just about to tell you, I haven't prepared much. Um, we've got Terry Pratchett up here because I'm a big fan of Terry Pratchett. We've got what? Um, Christmas present here from Suze Kempner, the autobiography of Elton John. Am I an Elton John fan? No. A um, uh, couple of uh, things here. Oh, <laughs> the compassionate mind approach to beating overeating. Lockdown. 
So, uh, no, they're not curated titles. That is just a pathetic reflection of what I passed the time doing. I sound very posh. What happened to Rotherham? I don't sound posh. Uh, this is something that comes up a lot. I'm going to guess that you're northern. No, southern. Um, southerners tend to think that I talk very common and northerners tend to think that I have a posh voice. I shouldn't have a posh voice. I grew up in a council house and I went to a comprehensive so I am utter scum. Anyway, anyway, as I was saying, I was watching this thing with this ventriloquist and he was just talking about how the puppets are made. And, you know, the detail that goes into the puppets that maybe when you were watching the ventriloquist show, you don't necessarily pick up on. He um, opened the heads of the puppets and showed all the mechan mechanicisms, the mechanics of how the, the puppet works. And I was enthralled. I watched the whole thing and I thought I should do something like that uh, with Myra because... You know, um, the relationship between myself and Myra is very similar to that of a ventriloquist and a ventriloquist dummy. Usually when you're watching ventriloquists, they, they form a sort of double act with this puppet. And the ventriloquist becomes the straight man and the dummy becomes the, the puppet that can say anything and that can, you know, has the license to insult. And so, so often uh, you'll watch a ventriloquist on stage and the puppet will start firing insults at someone in the audience and the, the ventriloquist will be there going, oh, I'm so sorry, I don't, I don't know what the puppet's saying. And, and that's very much like Myra. Um, Myra, is, Myra is known for insulting people in the audience and... Um, I often feel like the ventriloquist stood there going, oh, I, I, I didn't know. I didn't know what she was going to say. So uh, it gives you a tremendous amount of license. Anyway, so I thought Reuben Cornell. Now, Reuben is... Uh, actually, this is a good point, Reuben. Let's go over some... Let's go over some housekeeping before we go any further. Um... Uh, Ruben says, question for later. Um, if you have any questions, please do tweet them to, I don't know which side of the screen it's on. Is it this side? I'm waiting for this. This side. This side. Wait. Yeah. This side, Gareth Joyner. <laughs> I don't know why you needed to wait for me to do that. Tweet me at Gareth Joyner and I will answer your questions because as with Myra's uh, streams, the comments go whizzing by and I don't always have uh, my eye on them. So if you have a question, uh, do send them to my Twitter and I will check them on my phone there, which looks remarkably like Myra's phone, doesn't it? Um, so... Oh, if you don't have Twitter, do I need to send them there? Um, yes, okay, uh, fair enough. Just, just type your... I guess you're going to have to get a Twitter, <laughs> I suppose. I don't know. Try putting them in the comments. I will look every so often, but um, I might not necessarily... I might not see them. This won't be perfect, Megan. I'm afraid. I'm sorry. Um, so, yes, some housekeeping. Um, let's keep it nice in the comments. I think you will do anyway. But I, the, the following that Myra has cultivated has been... You're pretty respectful, but... um. You know, be nice to each other, uh, be nice to me. Also, um, we may talk about other quote-unquote drag acts uh, throughout the evening. If we do, um, I, I'm not interested in any petty squabbling or, you know, so I'm, I'm not interested in what do you think of blank or whoever. Um, because tonight's not about that. Uh, I will talk about my fellow artists with um, respect and, you know, let's just keep it nice. Um, what else was I going to say to you? I don't know. Tweet me at Gareth Joyner and, uh, yeah, let's move on with things. I've already got a selection of questions from you guys that you sent in. This is kind of nice, though. Um, who's Rose, friend or relation? Rose is Myra's sister, and if you don't know that, you're not paying attention. Uh, so... Uh, me, I'm Gareth. Hi, uh, I am 33 years old. I come from a small town uh, in South Yorkshire by the name of Rotherham, which you may have heard of already because our mutual friend Myra Dubois hails from Rotherham, much like myself. Um, I worked uh, in a working men's club as a glass collector, which may sound familiar to you because um, Myra Dubois also worked as a glass collector in a working men's club. So there are a lot of similarities. They do say write what you know, don't they? So um, so there is a lot of similarities between me and Myra. However, we do depart slightly because when I was at this working men's club collecting glasses, uh, later made it to the bar when I turned 18, uh, learned how to change a barrel. 
So when I was working at this working men's club, I used to watch the acts on the stage and um, there was a rotation of the acts and they all worked in all the different clubs in South Yorkshire. This wasn't that long ago. This was about 17 years ago. So, I mean, it's, you know, there'll be people watching this born after the millennium going, Gareth, that was an age ago, but for me it feels like yesterday because I'm 33 years old. And then there'll be people watching in their 40s going, Gareth, you're still a child. Anyway, so I used to watch these acts and they'd all do the circuit and they'd go around the pubs and clubs and they had their own little following and everything like that. And uh, they uh, they were sort of like rock stars if you take the small fish in a even smaller pond kind of metaphors. And I used to watch them with fascination. And um, I used to do very little work. I used to just glass collect and watch these acts. And then, do you think you get away with saying more as a northern than you would a southerner? Do tweet me your questions, Hayley, because um, I'll, I'll look, I'll try not to look. Uh, do tweet me your questions if you can, if you can, because then I can do it in a block, you see. If we've got any coming through already. Yes, would be the response. Uh, so, uh, I was watching these working men club acts and uh, I would sort of daydream. I've always been a daydreamer, even at school. I've always got one eye out the window thinking. You'll notice I have a very short attention span uh, as I will get easily distracted by things as we go through. I'll be halfway through a story and then I'll go, oh, my dog just moved. So, um, do excuse me. So, I was glass collecting and I'd watch these acts um, and I was absorbed by them. And then the time came for me to... No, I'm going about this the wrong way. Okay, so I watched all these working men club acts and um, I observed them. Separate to this, in another column, me and my friend were, and I've told this story many times, so if you've heard it, I apologize, but me and my friend decided to go to a fancy dress party, dressed as um, Rose West and Myra Hindley. Now, those two names might be familiar to you. So we went to this fancy dress party dressed as Rose West and Myra Hindley, respectively. My friend was Rose West. Richie, if you're watching, hi. Uh, I was Myra Hindley. We didn't look a lot like Rose West and Myra Hindley. I had a blonde bob wig on. I went to a fancy dress party shop in Sheffield on London Road, if you know it, and uh, had a poetic moment when we were filming for Everyone's Talking About Jamie. Bit of a lane change there, um, where we were being taken from the hotel to the location where we were doing the filming and we passed that very same fancy dress shop and I was in a, a coach or a, a bus, excuse me, with the son of a tutu, an anaphylactic, and I looked wistfully out of the window and noticed the calves that life had dealt us or something like that. Anyway, so I had a blonde bob on, a pair of glasses, I don't know why, Myra Hindley never wore glasses, that were in a sort of cat eye shape. And my friend uh, went for a very sort of frumpy look, like he had the big glasses on and the brown hair, which is a lot like Rose West. And we went to a night, I think called Fairy Liquid in Sheffield at the SU. We got raucously drunk. We had Barbie dolls on leads. Nice. And uh, we were sat on the sink at one point, asking people who was babysitting their kids while they were out. It was dark. Uh, I didn't say any of this publicly before going on Britain's Got Talent in case the Daily Mail went and fished it out. <laughs> so uh, anyway, the nickname stuck and uh, he started to call me Myra. I started to call him Rose. To amuse ourselves, we used to come up with these stories. And so I'd say, oh, how's Rose this week? And Richie would say, oh, she's uh, put a fiver on a scratch card and, and she's won. So she's taken the kids in, um, off to the caravan in Ingemales. How's Myra? And I'd say, oh, well, you know Myra. She's been at the end of the bar entertaining the fellas again down the club. And we just amused ourselves in this way. Uh, then I moved to London to go to university. I uh, went to study at Central St. Martins, communication, criticism, and curation in art and design. Uh, I did not graduate, however, because about halfway through my first year, I saw an advertisement for, on MySpace, which dates this anecdote, uh -huh -huh, uh, for a cabaret night at Madame Jojo's called uh, Finger in the Pie Cabaret. So I thought, I wonder if this Myra character will work on stage, because she made me and Richie laugh and Rose made me and Richie laugh. I wonder if Myra would work on stage. So um, I just wrote 10 minutes of material. I literally went on Google um, and typed in how to write a joke. And I read on, and you know, I've always been kind of like the class clown and people have always said like, oh, you're funny, Gareth, you know. 
which feels like a ridiculous thing to say as I deliver the driest story about the creation of Myra de Bois. Um, but then I, uh, I'd never formally thought about turning that into joke or stand up or anything. I need water. Um, so um, I googled how to write a joke, put 10 minutes of material together. I devised a story. I had to think of a reason for Myra to be on stage. Why was she on stage now? By the time, by the way, by this point, they had long shed any association with their infanticidal inspirations. So by this point, when we were talking about Myra, we are talking about a woman who's very separate from the Moors murders. So don't start. Um, and I, uh, I had to think, why is this Myra on stage? And I thought, well, singing is a good way to get it on on stage. Okay, so she's a singer and she's a celebrity. And uh, she was, fa I came up with some story about how she had been involved in a car accident and uh, she was driving and her career had gone off the rails and she was doing a comeback tour. That's why she was on stage that night. And I went on stage and I just did 10 minutes of this material to an on an open mic night to a crowd in Soho. And I got such big laughs and that is very addictive. Making people laugh is one of the most, uh, you know, strongest drugs there is. And uh, so I never looked back. I then got asked to host something at the London Burlesque Festival by Chaz Royale and um, did Finger in the Pie again. Eventually became the host of Finger in the Pie with Myra. She did that for 12 months. And it just snowballed and snowballed and snowballed until this moment tonight, sat in my living room talking down a webcam. So, um, oh, JK Manning says, I kind of wish I didn't know about Myra Hindley now. Hey, never meet your heroes. We will disappoint you. Um, so that's kind of how she came into being. She's been through very different stages and aesthetics and things over the years. And I think now would be a good point to go over to the questions. Now I think I've given you the, the basics. Uh, there was one question I wanted to start with from someone whose name I've taken off the email when I put it on the bit of paper. I'm sorry, um, I don't want to erase you. <laughs> <laughs> from this process. Um, if you're watching and you're in the comments, let us know who we are so we can um, we can attribute appropriately. They've said, hi Gareth. Hi. Um, a couple of questions for tomorrow's YouTube Tell All. Myra, when and where did she become a character rather than a drag act? What was the motivation for making her such? I can only think of one other gender discombobulationist who is a fully formed character with a backstory and an entirely consistent presentation, and that's the Duchess. I think that's news to both me, and it would be news to her as well. Panto. Oh, no, there's a different question here, so we'll do the first question first. So, as you've heard from the story, I wasn't especially into drag. Um, I wasn't... And I've... I've I don't like Myra being referred to as drag and I don't like her being referred to as a drag queen because for me it undermines the comedy of it and the comedy of Myra is the world she creates and the words she chooses to use and the relationships she has with her audience and everything. And I think one of the reasons I wanted to do tonight was to maybe, if I'm being vain, is this vain? I don't know. I wanted to sort of highlight that... Um, I wanted to highlight that uh, she is such a performance. I think people expect me to be like Myra, away from Myra, if you understand what I mean. People are always surprised that I'm as young as I am. And they're always, um, they, they all think I'm some like, you know, 50 year old chain smoking Blackpool resident. So, um, so I never wanted to be a drag queen. I like drag, um, I was, a but not necessarily drag that you would call drag. Um, I love the Rocky Horror Show. Oh my God, the Rocky Horror Show was so formative to me as a teen. I used to go around to a friend, Sharon's house. Well, actually, Colette was the friend. Sharon was her mum. She was an old goth from the 80s and uh, she still had a wardrobe full of gothy clothes and she used to always tell us about Pips, um, which apparently was some goth club in Manchester in the 80s. And uh, we used to go and dress in these, you know, clothes left over from Sharon's glory days and uh, we used to sit on the sofa drinking archers peach and uh, peach archers uh, watching rocky horror getting dragged up in corsets and fishnets and doing each other's purple makeup and i remember on one occasion sitting on a fence in the front garden swinging a bottle of archers around hollering at the moon um so i um 
so yeah, so I uh, I used to I was into Rocky Horror in that way. Um, I was very into Kiki and Herb, but again, I don't know if you'd necessarily call them drag. Um, they're they're characters and they're a cabaret act, so. You know, I guess it all stems from from that kind of thing. So I never uh, any how Myra came into existence wasn't me going. I want to do drag. What drag character will I use? What pseudonym shall I take on? What name will I use? It was I came up with a character and wanted to put her on stage. And if I wanted to put her on stage, then I was going to have to play it. Ergo, it kind of became drag. You know. Um, so yeah, that's kind of when she became a character rather than a drag act. It was from the beginning first. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, Graham says, my friend picked up on the Kiki and Herb. Oh, that's nice. David Hoyle was also a big inspiration of mine as well. And I was watching back a video the other day of Myra's first ever performance. And oh, you can tell. <laughs> you can tell that I'd been watching David Hoyle because I was more or less mimicking him. Uh, in how he talks and how he uses his hands when he enunciates and everything. Um, uh, but that, I think, is a natural part of the creative process. There are be people who have come along since me that I can tell are influenced by me. And I don't mind because I was them at one point with other people. Uh, so it's just kind of the natural way things go. You know, people people see something, they're inspired by it, they adopt it for a little bit, and eventually they polish it until it becomes something that is their own. Distant Cousin is saying Lily Savage, Day and Medner Everidge. Yep, two really, um, uh, really famous examples. Um, I think Lily Savage is a lot closer to Myra in that we both spawned out of the gay scene. Um, Dame Edna was always more of a, a, a satirical. I think Dame Edna is a, a straight man um, impersonating a woman. Whereas Myra and Lily Savage are more of a, a kind of a drag as a queer energy, which is expressing something that's within. Um, but listen, I don't know Barry Humphreys and I'm not his therapist or his psychologist, so I might be wrong on that. Maybe he is. Steph Evans is saying Mrs. Shufflewick. Yes, Mrs. Shufflewick is interesting because she is very similar to Myra. I should not say it that way around. She came long before Myra. Myra is similar to Shufflewick, but I never saw Shufflewick because um, I have books on Shufflewick. Um, which I shouldn't have mentioned on camera because that is on loan from Lola Lasagna and I've had it for about five years yet and she might ask for it back now. <laughs> but um, but I never saw Shufflewick. I've only heard about Miss Shufflewick um, retrospectively. I was paid a huge compliment on Twitter the other day when uh, someone whose name I have forgotten um, said that Myra is the spiritual successor to Mrs Shufflewick, which was uh, lovely. Um... What are we talking about now? I'm just making sure. Jamie Norton, I've seen you many times at the Two Brewers and you were hysterical, phenomenal timing. Thank you very much. That's very nice of you to say. James Caldwell has said, has she re reached her final form? I don't think so. The nice thing about Myra is that she um, evolves because I've been doing her for so long. And I think this goes in for, a, there was a nice question that I prepared. I prepared some slides. What is this, a government briefing? Um, let me find it, let me find it. No, 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 no. Oh, here we go. Hello, Gareth. Really looking forward to this evening. I love the character of Myra and how she has developed, particularly during the lockdown. I see her as a fully domed 3D character as opposed to the drag, which is why the character can work so well in Panto in the way that Lily Savage did and Dame Edna. Have you ever tried developing another female character or had any idea for other cre uh, creations? And then they ask about a certain television programme. Bake Off. No, I'm joking. Um... So, yes, uh, no, I've never thought about doing another female character um, because, as I said, creating the character for me was an organic process and it, it wasn't necessarily drag I wanted to do. There is another character, uh, Mr. Frank Lavender. I don't know if you are familiar with him. I have a picture. Um, do I show it? Shall I show you Frank now? 
No, I don't think I will. No, we'll save Frank. But there is another character. I don't feel compelled to create other female characters, although you could argue that the way Rose has developed is a... Um, she is another character. Um, she's played by my friend Lucy Frederick, who is a very good uh, comedian and actor. Uh, so... Um, so she is, and I do consider Rose to be one of my characters, you know, I sort of, me and, me and Lucy have an understanding of that, you know, she plays Rose, but I have sort of say over what Rose is and does, so she's one of my characters. And there are so many characters littered around what I now sort of affectionately tongue-in-cheek refer to the MDU, the Married of War universe. So there are people like um, Guru Malcolm, who you will have heard of, who is uh, Myra's spiritual advisor. Uh, used to be a C of E uh, vicar, but he was uh, discommunicated, uncommunicated, I can't remember the word, struck off. Um, and he's become a sort of offstage character that I refer to. Um, there is Frank Lavender, who is the, um, I always refer to Frank as the other side of the same coin as Myra. Um, he's the sort of the Joker to her, no, Myra is the Joker to Frank's Batman really they they exist sort of in tandem with each other um there is levi who is rosa's uh, uh child and myra's nibbling a, a non-binary individual who we have yet to see on screen i would love to get levi on screen at some point and i do have a list of non-binary comedians i would like to play levi um but how she came into or they came into existence uh was um Myra had a joke about children uh, being brought up gender neutral and and this was about seven or eight years ago and um, Myra had a joke about how Rose had decided to bring up the child as uh, not uh, not as non-binary as gender neutral and it was a problem for Myra because she was running out of oatmeal baby clothing to buy them. And it was just an offhand comment. And then after a while, I started to think, oh, come on, Gareth, you're better than that joke, just taking the piss out of gender-neutral baby clothing. Do better, Gareth. So I considered uh, dropping the character of Levi very subtly, because, you know, it's not a prominent character. Uh, they get mentioned every so often. Whilst Myra's been streaming from home, she will say, oh, our Levi showed me how this worked or something. She's there in conversation if you're paying attention. Uh, but I decided to keep the character of Levi because I thought it would be good to have someone in existence on display who is non-binary and it isn't punchline, that they just exist as a character. And Myra, when she's introducing, uh, when she does Part of Your World from The Little Mermaid, she will say that she used to babysit her nibbling Levi. And, uh, and it creates this image I have in my head that's as close as Myra gets as to maternal and nurturing, which is watching The Little Mermaid with this kid. Uh, whilst babysitting and in a way I'm projecting my child self onto Levi in that scenario because I used to be the kid sat on the rug watching The Little Mermaid. So there's kind of a lot going on there psychologically and I have a lot like this going off in my head. I think this is something that helps with Myra's dimensions. I think uh, I think the reason that Myra feels like such a 2D character, because there'll be people, I haven't got the comments uh, on yet, so I don't know what you're saying, but I'll have a look in a bit. But, um, but there is so much going off in my head that you as the audience won't know about when I'm performing Myra. And I think that's why she is so three-dimensional. Um, I said two-dimensional earlier, I meant three. Uh, I think that's why she's so three-dimensional, because like with people, there is so much going on with people um, that you don't know about, that you won't know about, that contributes to who you see before you then. So I have a whole backstory in my head. I have actually started writing my resort of biography. Whether it will see the light of day, I don't know. But um, there's this whole backstory in my head of who Myra is and where she comes from and what her life experience has been. And I think that kind of adds to what you see. Um, <clears throat> other characters are, and I've because I've recently just relisted re everyone. I wrote a document. And I put everyone on there that I've that Myra's ever even mentioned. There is her ex Mortimer, the one who she was going to have children with. And there is a bit of material on that that you might be familiar with. There is um, her fan, her number one fan, Thomas, who is a, uh, a a mute stalker that is obsessed with Myra Dubois that did her tech 
in 2013 when back then he was played by Jonathan Richardson if you're watching hi Jonathan um, and there's her solicitors Norfolk and Chance uh, and you know there's all these people that she refers to in her life and they don't exist yet but I would very much like to bring them into existence one of the great joys of 20 um, 2020 <laughs> it was so traumatic I had to block the fucking thing from my head I swore I said I wouldn't um, so, um, you, what was that? One of the greatest joys about 2020 has been bringing Rose out and nurturing Rose with Lucy. Lucy is the third person, I think, to play Rose. <laughs> so the first person would have been my friend, Richie, who dressed up as Rose, uh, on, on a night out in Sheffield. I do have a photo of that. I wish I'd have uh, prepared it and brought it with me. Maybe I'll show you another time. Um, but... There was Richie, then my friend Heidi Heels, they played Rose uh, for a couple of shows. And then I played Rose in some videos uh, for Dead Funny, which was the show I did at the Edinburgh Fringe and then took to Australia. And then how Lucy came to play Rose is that we did Britain's Got Talent this year and last year. And we, once I found out I was through to the finalists, they said, well, we're gonna make a little sort of video to introduce Myra, so what do you wanna happen? And I said, oh, I want Rose to be there. And I was with my friend Lucy and I said, you should play Rose, because Lucy, as you know, if you've seen Rose Lavender, has wonderful comic, comic timing. And if you watched the streams for A Problem Shared that we did where Rose was in the room reading out the questions, we just riff off each other in a really natural way that's really nice. So like we didn't script anything and I know when to interrupt her and she knows when to interrupt me. And it, you know, it's just a, it's a good energy. And so bringing that into three-dimensional form after having it in my head and referenced to for four years. I think for the longest time, Rose only featured in the stuff about I Know Him So Well, in the material about singing the song of the sister. So I want to do more of that. I really want to bring more of these people. Um, let me look at the comments. I don't want to... Um, I don't want to miss anything. Lewis Wharton says, Who are your comedic inspirations? I mean, I couldn't... I've been thinking about that a lot recently. Um, when you talk non-stop, and this is a conversation and we are talking, but there's no one else, and I panic about leaving dead air like this. So I feel the need to be constantly talking, and uh, that means that my throat gets very dry because I'm constantly pushing air through it. Um, my comic inspirations... Um, I've been thinking a lot about this recently. One of them, and and it's funny how you forget things because you see things when you're younger and it becomes your inspiration because you absorb it and you don't really think about it. But I have only just started to consider how influ influential the Austin Powers movies were on me because I remember the moment where I realized that Austin Powers was the same person played that played Dr. Evil. And I remember that blew my mind. I was like, no, no, that's the same person. And I couldn't get over it. And I was like, I, I, I was looking for the joins, you know what I mean? And so that it's a source of kind of pride to me um, that I think, I mean, you might, you might, you might know it. Um, you might be able to look and go, oh, I can see that that's Myra. Or you might every so often go, oh, I, I heard Myra's voice there. But I think generally that I, there's a huge difference between me and Myra. And also there's a huge difference between me, Myra and Frank. I think if you look at the three of us together, you wouldn't necessarily immediately clock that they were all played by the same person. And that's a big thrill for me because I love that in Austin Powers. Let me show you Frank now. Uh, oh, no, 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 no. That wasn't Frank at all. Where's Frank? Oh, hang on. Here we go. We've had the first technical cock up of the. Oh, maybe we won't get to see Frank. I tell you what, Google him. Well, there's a good opportunity for you to see Frank soon anyway, because he is um, doing a show at the Royal Vauxhall Tavern on the 30th of June. So you can book for that. But Google Frank Lavender, Google Mario de Bois, and then look at this face, this angelic face and line us up against each other. You can't tell it's the same person. Let me show you baby Myra. Because one question was, how has Myra developed? So let us let me show you baby Myra. I'm keeping an eye on the time. By the way, I think we're going to... If we're cooking with gas and we've still got questions to go through, I'll go on, but I'm thinking we'll finish this at nine. Let's see how we do. Anyway, 
This is uh, Baby Myra. So this was Myra Dubois, uh, the first ever time she stepped on stage. Can you see? It, it looks like Myra, doesn't it? Everything's there, all the elements are there. You'll notice that she's wearing pearls. Uh, I can tell you now, it's very, I very rarely she wears pearls anymore because it is so tedious that every time you do, some gay goes, oh, you wearing a pearl necklace? <laughs> so uh, she doesn't really wear pearls anymore. But the leopard print is there, the blonde hair is there. Um, uh, it looks like Myra today, although much thinner, but then ain't we all. This is Myra's second outing. You can see I went for a slightly bigger hair. The, on the, the, the image on the where she sat on the chair, uh, there's kind of an Amy Winehouse aesthetic to it. And that's really suitable because this was around about 2008. So um, there she is with her chicken drumstick knees on show. You can see how the sort of the transition went. I'm getting experimental. The makeup's getting a bit bigger. This is uh, not long after that. Very much a baby Jane look, isn't it? She looks very, uh, very baby Jane here. Very baby Jane Hudson. And, um, oh, I don't know why. So you can see where the kind of, you can see what the sort of early development was. Um, Baby Jane was a huge influence on Myra when I was first putting it together, which flummoxes me where today people will still tweet me a picture of Baby J You know that gif of Baby Jane putting her makeup on? People will tweet me that gif as some sort of read, like, oh, you look like Baby Jane. Like, yeah, no, I, I know. Very much one of the things that I traced over when I was creating Myra. Harumph. Um, so she's one of the things I... Uh, also, Norma Desmond. I always remember thinking that Myra Dubois was a sort of Norma Desmond of the Ma Amateur Dramatic Society. Um, I, was, I did a lot of Amateur Dramatics as a kid, and I remember being in a production of Oliver, and the actor playing Bill Sykes was 19, and the actor playing Nancy was 44. And that was so funny to me. Oh, someone asked in the comments I saw further up how old, um, how old Myra is. And I think that's a really good question because I don't know. I have an Asta and I wouldn't. I wouldn't have the audacity to. Um, but that's a good kind of get out of jail card for me because I think it's important that she is older than you. <laughs> so I will speak to some people who are in their 30s and they'll go, oh, Myra's in her 40s, isn't she? And I'll speak to people in her 40s and they'll go, Myra's in her 50s and so on and so on. So she, she just has a general air of being older than, a little older than you. And, and I quite like that um, freedom. Uh, it reminds me a little bit like characters in the Beano. They, they, they're, they're for, or the, the Simpsons, for example, they're always that age, you know, and you never quite get a, you never quite get a, a thing answered. Listen, I was so insistent. I was so insistent that people tweet me questions and I haven't looked at Twitter yet. So let's have a look at what you're saying on Twitter after I crapped on for so long about you and you and Twitter. Ruben Cornell says, at what point do, during the Myra transformation does he take over your body and mind? That's an enjoyable question. Uh, usually the lipstick, the eyebrows. If people have ever watched me slap up, and I don't like people watching me slap up because I like to get in character when I'm doing that one, when I'm going through that process. And I get into character. And if you're watching this and you do drag and you don't have a character like Myra is, you still get into character. You still have a state. Even even if you're a stand-up comedian that just walks onto, state, onto a stage in jeans and a t-shirt and tells jokes, you have a character. You have that personality that you sort of put on yourself, like armour, ready to go into battle, to use a hackneyed metaphor. So, um, so I like to do that during that process. I'm going to drink my tea. I made some green tea before I came here and I haven't had any now. So I'm going to bring the tea into the show, if we can call it a show. Just say cheers for a moment. Mmm. Mmm. Tepid and cold. So I don't like people in the room when I'm getting ready. And if you are in my inner circle of friends, um, you will know that there's usually a point where you have to sort of leave me to it because I become unresponsive and just talking in grunts. And that's usually your cue to go. Because I like to get into character. And I get into character by pulling faces at the mirror. You know, there's certain um, certain mannerisms and certain facial tics that um, 
lend a set themselves to Myra and do it. And, and Frank, uh, when it's Frank, it's all in the body language. I like stick my gut out and hang backwards. Like the, the sort of gravitational weight on my body shifts to sort of more like that. And, uh, and I like to pull faces in the mirror and strut around. So it's usually round about the lipstick and the eyebrows. Uh, and of course, anyone will tell you, you, you perform a character from the shoes up. If the shoes are right, you can play anyone. So, I hope that answers your question. Ali says, how do you get your hair so shiny and healthy from a jealous bold man? Thanks, Ali. It's grease. Brad says, question, who's your biggest influence on Myra? I think we've kind of covered that one already. It's a, it's a solid, it's an evergreen question. But the thing is, I don't think you can say that there is a big influence on Myra. I'll tell you what was a big influence on Myra, the musical Cabaret, specifically the 2006 revival, which was wonderful. Um, it was such a good revival of that show. And at the time, in the late noughties, there was a huge Cabaret boom going on. So um, every, burlesque was everywhere and people were doing, um, you know, there was magic. There was like, there was an act at the time I remember called Pava Botti, the naked tenor. And his thing was that he used to sing opera um, in the buff. That was it. And he had, a, he had a balloon, a long balloon. He had a long balloon and two little balloons, I think. And he walked on and he just sang Nessa Dorma holding these balloons over his package. Sort of chubby ginger guy. Odd, odd. And um, and so there was this scene uh, where Pete and Finger and the Pie Cabaret was part of that scene. And, um, and there was a, a comedy duo called Aliens Ate My Schnitzel and another one called Moonfish Rumba. <laughs> it was all all beautiful nonsense. And um, uh, and I worked on that scene, which is where um, um, I, Alexis Dubas was doing Marcel Lacan around the same time. That's where he and I first met. So... Um, so there was this scene going on, and um, and meanwhile, while that was on, the revival of Cabaret was on in town. So I was going to dressing rooms and, you know, watching people roll on their fishnets and put their corsets on and everything. And, and then I went and watched the show Cabaret, and it was so life-becoming-art sort of thing um, that that was a big influence on me. I don't know if that answered your questions. What you're saying in the comments... Oh, Joe Pay says, I just want to say I saw you at the Clapham Grand just before Christmas and it was amazing. Thanks for everything you do. Well, thank you very much, Joe. Do you know what? Over the pandemic, I have um, taken sort of a certain amount of affection for my job. I'm less embarrassed by it. I'll say you that much. I was in the television studios when we were doing uh, Britain's Got Talent and I had an application open, open which may be homosexual queer people used to communicate with, with each other on by a process of how far away from you someone is. I was talking to someone on one of these apps and uh, he said, what do you do? And I said, oh, I'm a comedian. And for the first time, I felt like quite proud of that. Like I quite, I felt quite, I think what we, um, I'm, without getting too earnest and too sniffing your own farts, um, I think the pandemic has shown me that I, for a living, I make people laugh and the pandemic has shown me the value of that. So, you know, um, Stuart, how much of Myra's sharp comebacks during live shows are already in your comedy toolbox and do you ever surprise yourself with unplanned ones? Yes, absolutely. Yes, I do. I never write material. I um I write it on stage, and so my gigs like the Royal Vauxhall Tavern, uh, the Eagle in Manchester, uh, the Two Brewers, these are the gigs where I workshop material, and then once I like something, and once I like a bit, I will sharpen it up and put it in a show, which I then take to the Edinburgh Fringe, or Australia, or on tour in the UK later in the year, fingers crossed if we're allowed to. Um, so I, yes, I always surprise myself. I always forget them as well. Like, people will say to me, oh, do you remember that time you said that? No recollection of it. No recollection of it whatsoever. None. Uh, which is annoying because I probably say some good stuff that I could get paid good money for, but <laughs> I forget it. Um, 
sometimes they are planned sometimes they are sometimes you have a, a you know a, a good solid line and you know it's going to bring the house down and you go for it but then sometimes it isn't and that's the joy of doing what i do and ha why i like working how i work okay let's read another one that was sent in advance god it's caught to nine already we might be here for some time uh, hi gareth i'd love to hear if you'd ever been in a situation where you've actually found yourself thinking what would myra do or in other words has myra unique brand of wisdom ever come in handy for gareth and um, you may have noticed oh that's from erin by the way thank you erin you may have noticed over the last year uh, myra's work has become very um self-help orientated and um that again myra shifts through um myra morphs and changes in relation to what's going on in my own life so for example uh, three years ago i got sober i quit alcohol i uh, stopped drinking and myra's always been a good time party girl and myra had really become an excuse for gareth to go party so i'd go to pubs i'd go to clubs i'd do my act wouldn't, didn't care if it went well or not because I could get absolutely obliterated and I encouraged it, you know, I worked it into the act. Some of you will remember, I used to get people to bring trays and trays and trays of shots over. And so Myra's material was very much about that life. There was lots of material about getting plastered. It's where she used to say things like, you're never single with a double and all that sort of thing. Um, and then I got sober. And then I, in my personal life, had to address the reasons that I was drinking so heavily in the first place. So I'm a big fan of John Grant and um, he uses this metaphor that I have regurgitated many times where he says that addiction is like a deep snow and recovery is spring that melts the snow and all that you're left with is the dog shit that the snow was covering. <laughs> so once I stopped drinking, I was left with why I was drinking. And I had to uh, acknowledge that. And so I started going to therapy. I started meditating. I started, there's some mindfulness books on the stage. I started doing mindfulness. I got very into that kind of world. And I'm still very into that sort of thing now. So it became only natural that Myra would co-opt that. Because when you go through anything, you you when you're a comedian or you create comedy you're always you've always your amygdala is always looking for like that's a joke you know and storing it away your little numbskulls going around going remember that put that in there you use that for a joke like the other day for example i bought a bath bomb from the yorkshire soap company very nice bath bomb it had bits of orange peel in it and i'm sat in the bath and as i'm sat here bits of orange peel are floating around all over the place and i thought sat in the bath it feels like i'm in the bath with food items and then I just thought, Sunday roast dinner bath bombs. That's very funny. So I made an advert for Beauty by Rose, which some of you may have seen on the stream uh, on Marriage Last Quiz last week. So by going to therapy, obviously Myra starts going to therapy. Now I started to think about whether I wanted one-on-one -on -one therapy. And, um, and I thought, or group therapy. And I thought, well, I'll want one-on-one -on -one therapy. And then I thought Myra would go for group therapy because she'd need an audience. And so I changed that into a line which you may have heard, you may have heard that joke. And so um, so I do follow Myra's own advice and some of it is good advice because it's based on it's based on real things that I've learned in therapy and through reading about mindfulness. So um, serenity breathing, for example, you may have noticed that now we're into the conversation of tonight. Um, I'm a bit more flowing, you know, I'm, I'm a bit more comfortable uh but for the first 10 minutes i was a bit like right is this working is that is that is that, is, is this uh i'm like that when i enter any new conversation or any new situation i need a moment to just sort of anchor myself so serenity breathing when i do serenity well myra does serenity breathing at the top of her show it's always after the first number and that is me just acclimatizing myself to the room that's me giving myself time to sort of flatten my mind and i've turned it into a joke but I am genuinely doing a bit of mindfulness there. So, no, you know. so yes, I do take Myra's advice because it is based in reality. That was either fascinating or very boring. Uh, let's see what you're saying on Twitter. Scott says, besides Frank and Myra, are there other people waiting in their wings to make their debut? I think we've answered that. They are. Will they be played by me? I don't think so because I like uh, the feeling of working in a company. 
I like feeling like uh, collaborating. I like, uh, you know, I've got the people that I work with a lot, they're my friends, uh, that I always ask them to come and do stuff with me. You will have seen them in things. Um, so I think, uh, possibly, but not played by me. Harry J. Bartlett says, do you think Northern drag queens get away with more savage humour than a Southerner would? No, I don't believe in the North-South divide. I work up North, I work down South, the same material works well whether you're up north or down south. I think the north-south divide is fictitious and it's something that I really kind of resent because occasionally it's weaponized against us as it was during the tier system uh, before Christmas. However, keep it light, keep it frothy, keep it camp. Heather Perry says, how much of Myra do you think comes from growing up queer in place like 90s Rotherham? Only her very northern style of comedy, aha, contradicting me, is she a way of reclaiming a place that you might have complex feelings towards Heather Parry. Heather, Heather Parry. A little bit of info on Heather Parry. Heather Parry uh, is in Scotland now, but we went to college together. So Heather is asking this question with some insight into what it is to grow up queer and in Rotherham. Um, okay, so before we talk about this, some stuff on the word queer. Um, I myself identify as queer more than anything else. Um, I don't identify as gay. I don't really identify as male. I don't really identify as cisgendered. I identify as queer because it's a nice term that just means not quite anything, not quite right. <laughs> so um, in, in terms of my gender, in terms of what's expected of me because I pass as a cis man, um, in terms of who I'm sexually attracted to. I think queer covers that kind of all those bases. Um, I am aware that some people really do not like the use of the word queer because they experience bullying with it at school. So when I talk about this and I talk about queer, I'm talking about for me. Uh, so this is very personally in relation to me. If you don't like the word queer, then um, I wouldn't use it to describe you. So, um, how much of Myra do I think comes from growing up queer in a place like 90s Rotherham? Um, I am, this isn't something I've really thought about before. I think... When I was 16, we, we being myself, my mother, my sister, my stepfather, we moved to a pub. No, I was, tell a lie, I was 13. We moved to a pub in Manchester. And I used to, I was old enough to interact with the adults, but I was uh, still too young to be an adult. Uh, but I was also old enough to have sexual feelings. I knew by this point I was queer. I knew I was, quote unquote, that there was something not right with me. That not right, you know, I now understand there's nothing wrong with me, but then I didn't know. And um, it was quite a tough situation to be in because you were constantly watching yourself and making sure that you weren't found out. That was the big thing, you mustn't be found out. So you built up big walls and defences. And I found that mine was to have a quick mouth. And I remember people saying like to my mum, like he is so quick, he is so sharp, or oh, you're gonna have trouble with this one. Because if anyone tried anything with me, I had a come down to come back at them with, you know. So, um, so I don't know if Myra as a character comes out of me being queer in Rotherham, but certainly me wanting to be on stage and having control and getting away with saying things and, you know, making people laugh, seeking validation, being liked, you know, having a place in the scheme of things. I think that comes out of uh, being queer in a place like 90s Rotherham, by which I think Heather is using that as a shorthand for very, very queer phobic. <laughs> Uh, shout out to everyone that's still in Rotherham. God bless. Get out soon. Let's have a look in the comments. Oh, ah, ha, ah, ha, ha, ha. This is a good one. Uh, you may have already spoken about this, but where is Myra's voice from and her laugh? So, um, Myra's voice, and I, oh, I'm so, look at, look how I'm jiggling around in my seat. <laughs> uh, Myra's voice uh, comes out of a very bad Quentin Crisp impression that I used to do. I was, um, my, I came, Myra happened very early on in my life. I was 21 when I first put her on stage and she had been 
in my mind for about two years prior to this. So I was 19 when me and my friend Richie went on the night out dressed as Myra Hindley and Rose West. And I was 21 when I first put Myra on stage. And at the time, I was reaching out for pieces of literature um, films in which I could see myself in. I was uh, enveloped in the Scissor Sisters who were around at that time. Uh, they gave me a real sense of identity and place. And another thing that I did was I sought out um, Quentin Crisp. I read the books, The Naked Civil Servant, and I read, um, I watched the film with John Hurt. And this was before the second film, so I, I, I saw that in the cinema. And I, um, I've always had a not a talent, but an enthusiasm for mimicking other people's voices. And it's not necessarily that I, I'm good at doing impressions of people, but I will pick up on vocal inflections and how someone talks and the cadence of someone speaking. And I and I do sort of ape it and amplify it and, and things. Uh, and, and so I was just walking along. I was walking down a road in Rotherham. I can't remember the way, uh, the name of the road, but I can tell you it's on the way from the cemetery to the Tabard pub in Herringthorpe if anyone knows Rotherham. And I was walking down this road and I was practicing Quentin Crisp's voice to myself, which is very like, um, at the beginning of the um, Boy George record, he goes, popularity breeds contempt. You know, and it, it's this nasal way of talking. Uh, and so I'd been not working on a Quentin Crisp impression. I'd just been practicing how Quentin Crisp talks for my own amusement. And then I came up with the Myra character and I had to find a voice for her. And I thought, do I, if that very first video of my first uh, performance of Myra, I'm not doing a voice, I'm just using this voice. And then after a while, I thought she needs a voice. I didn't want it to be a high pitched falsetto, which is kind of what it's become. But I didn't want to come it fr to a, from a place of, oh, I'm a lady and I'm a woman and women just have instinctively higher voices. Um, but I wanted it to be a voice that was separate from my own. And I just borrowed this Quentin Crisp uh, voice. You know, it, so it's kind of there. And Myra's laugh was in a panto. I think it was... I think it was Jack and the Beanstalk. It might have been a lesin, one of the adult pantos that I wrote. Um, anyway, there was a bit where she had to laugh for a long time for dramatic effect. And I just kind of, I was already in my head voice, for those that know singing technique, I was already in my nasal passages, and I just kind of went, <laughs> and I just kept it going in this sort of parrot-like fashion, and it kind of, it just sort of gelled. So that's how Myra's uh, voice uh, came about. I'm scanning, I'm scanning. Where haven't you performed that you would like to do a show? I'd love to go back to the London Palladium. It was, it's very special to me that I got to perform on stage at the London Palladium for five short minutes as I did my Britain's Got Talent audition with Myra. But I would love to be at the Palladium on my own terms. It was, it, everything they tell you about the Palladium stage is right. It feels not unlike being on stage at the Royal Vauxhall Tavern because you, you stand there, you can see everyone, you can command attention in a way. It, it, it's almost laid out like a Greek amphitheatre. Beautiful stuff. Um, where does Dubois come from? That's a funny story. Um, Megan Moore says, do I write comedy for others? I do, but I'm very selfish, so um, I can only write comedy if I'm imagining myself performing it. Tom Ball says, uh, where did... Where does Dubois come from? So Dubois, so this is funny. I, uh, we, we, as I said, I divorced Myra from Hindley. And she was just Myra. She was just Myra. And then when it came to putting her on stage, I had to come up with a surname. I didn't know what to call her. I went through many different versions. There was an idea to make her American, but then I thought I couldn't keep up the accent. There was an idea to make her dead. So at the beginning of all of Myra's, um, excuse me, just burped. At the beginning of all of Myra's uh, shows, she would appear as, like, summoned, like an apparition, like in a seance. Um, and then I scrapped that idea. And then uh, I ended up with the Myra we know today. And I had to think of a surname for this person. I had a CD copy of the producers uh, at my halls of residence. It was when I was at St. Martin's University staying at the halls of residence in New Cross Gate. History lovers. 
And uh, I had a copy of the CD for the producers on my desk and I had gone away and I was filling out the form at university to apply to the Finger in the Pie Cabaret. And I was filling in the form and they said stage name. And I thought, I can't just call her Myra. She has to be Myra something. And I thought about this CD for the producers and I remembered that there was a character called Roger Dubois. So I just went, oh, I'll call it Roger Dubois. I have since found out and realised it's Roger Debris. It's not Roger Dubois at all. I've just made it up. So there you go. I'd love to tell you that there was something clever going on there. I would love to tell you that it was like of the wood or something. Myra of the wood. No, I just borrowed it because I saw it and it sounded show busy. Myra's real name, Prescott, uh, for those that want to know, are, um, it was when Facebook were clamping down and they were going around deleting profiles, do you remember, uh, that didn't have quote unquote real names which was very problematic for queer people but different subject for a different street so um i didn't want to change the name of that to gareth, to gareth joiner because as you people know i like to keep um the the identities very separate so i um i i thought i'm gonna have to give her a real name well it's not uncommon for people to change their names for showbiz reasons so i'll change her name so Myra Dubois can be her showbiz name, as Myra tells you, she married show business and Dubois is her married name. And um, I needed a, a, a name that wasn't that. So I just took Prescott because it is my great grandma's name. <laughs> and that's how Myra became Myra Elizabeth Prescott. I can't believe Dubois didn't come from Blanche from a streetcar named Desire, says Heather Perry. No, I know. A lot of people think it's a streetcar named Desire reference. I would love such a, a literary point of reference. I'm afraid not. Someone once came up to me uh, at a gig afterwards, very early on in my quote-unquote career, and said, ah, Dubois. Very clever. And walked off. And I just let them compliment me and took it and went, yes, thank you. No idea why. Scaffolder says, great to hear how Myra relates to you. Question, at what point of the character, at what point does the character Myra inhabit you before a show? How easy is it switched between, between Myra, Gareth and Frank? Um, I think I've already answered part of that question. But to answer the second part of the question, how easy is it to switch between Myra, Frank and Gareth? I find it harder to harness Frank's energy. Um... Frank is a, a harder performer for me to do and I think it's just because I don't perform him as much so I don't work the muscle as much. So I have to concentrate a little harder when I'm being Frank. Myra's just like turning on tap. I can do phone interviews as a... I can record her voice if I have to. I can... Um, you know, it, it's, it's very easy. Uh, between Gareth, that's something I'm working on. Um, another... Another reason for me doing this stream with you people here tonight was that I think I cling to Myra. Well, I know I cling to Myra um, because um, it's good to, you know, I, I mentioned that I no longer drink and I think that um, when you're drinking, you're losing yourself. You're detaching yourself from yourself because you don't like yourself. And I think I have since abandoning alcohol, replaced alcohol, with Myra Dubois. <laughs> so I uh, like to lose myself in Myra Dubois, which is unhealthy. I'm a performer. I've always wanted to perform. I always wanted to act. So I just wanted to take a night off from Myra to converse with you people. I cannot believe 160 people are watching me waffling on. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Uh, and I am doing a show uh, in the new world uh, without Myra Dubois. I can't tell you where, I can't tell you what, but I do hope if you were able to, you will come along and see that. And let's find out how easy it is to switch between Myra, Gareth and Frank. What's going on in the comments? What is your greatest achievement as Myra? That depends on my mood. I mean, if we're talking about it in a... If, you, if you're talking about, you know, career and, and achievements, then I guess... Um, I guess doing the... Palladium and Britain's Got Talent was an achievement, but honestly, just cultivating a following where my silly ideas are indulged and to get to a place now where Myra has enough of a following that I can do this or that I can put a show on at the Vauxhall Tavern or I can get a new people will come and watch it and I get to do my ideas out on stage, that is probably the best achievement, I think. Um... I mean, I only did Britain's Got Talent because we wanted to sell tickets on the road. So the idea was do Britain's Got Talent, 
do a UK tour, do Edinburgh Festival and sell tickets on the road. It was just, you know, a little thing. And that and that sort of <laughs> didn't happen because the coronavirus came in. But um, so that is the main thing I like doing, going on a stage and being able to do my ideas. I hope that makes sense. What else are we saying here? Um, oh, thank you. Uh, that's really nice that you people are saying you're enjoying this. Gareth Denny says, you might think it's waffle, but it's so interesting. John Patrick Flanagan says, can I just say this is fantastic. Um, thank you so much for uh, saying that because uh, this is something you may may know, maybe you don't know if you're a performer yourself. We are so insecure and um, it really does. If And I say this before, if you ever watch someone stream, um, please go to Twitter and tell them you've enjoyed it. Not just me, any performer out there that's doing it because after a stream, when we close the laptop and there is nothing but the echoing silence of our own accommodation, Oh my god. <laughs> anyway, uh, Ian Wychart says, what's the dream? Um, I just want to be able to do, if I could progress my career in a way, I would like to be able to do my ideas on a wider scale. My favourite shows are the shows that have Myra opening, sorry, no, Frank opening, then an interval, then Myra in the second act. And that's because I think what I do is drag performance. But I think some people attempted to say that Myra is uh, Myra's the drag act and Frank is a comedy character. And that's not right for me. For me, they're both comedy characters and part of the same drag act. Like, drag, if you ask me, is the conversation between gender and clothing. If that makes sense to you. So if your performance has an element of gender and clothing having some form of a conversation with each other, whether that conversation is my gender that I was assigned at birth does not correlate with the clothes I'm wearing right now, or I am trying to project a cartooned ultra version of something gendered through my clothing choices, that's drag. So for me, Frank and Myra are part of the same drag act. So a show where I get to do both of those things, I get to do Frank in the second act, Myra, Frank in the first act, Myra in the second act, so the audience can compare and contrast. And then I get to do production things as well, like having backing dancers, having Rose with us, hiring someone to play Guru Malcolm, that kind of thing. That's my dream. So to do that, you have to have enough people in the theatre watching it. So however I access that wider audience, that's how I'd want to do that. I hope that makes sense. That felt like a tangent. Um, how easy was it to adapt Myra um, for Panto? This is a good question and it's something a few people have asked me. And by the way, if you submit a question and I don't answer it, I'm so sorry. We've already gone past nine o'clock and people are still watching. So I guess let's keep going. I was going to finish things at nine, but I, I feel like momentum's still there. We've got 158 people currently watching and people are asking questions. So I'll carry on going. But if we get to the end and I don't get your question, I, I, I apologise. Panto, how easy is Myra to adapt from Panto? And someone asked also, whose name I didn't put down on the email. I'm so sorry. Panto, Myra is an ugly sister or villain. Absolutely, given the nature of these characters. But as a dame, usually a far more sympathetic characterization discuss and I know she's been one we've seen her Sarah and um, so Sarah was when Myra played Sarah the cook in uh, Dick Whittington um, in Hoddesdon I didn't have the best time in that show and I say that with affection to the producers Paul Holman Associates and the theatre and um, the spotlight in Hoddesdon both wonderful what didn't work for me personally in that show was that the dame wasn't the right kind of dame for Myra it was she was Sarah the cook the script was for some comics written the year before and uh, they got all the funny business and Myra was underused really um, Myra as Dame Trot in Jack and the Beanstalk worked incredibly well and I know what you're saying but that dames are usually rosy-cheeked, mumsy characters, so like, oh Jack, you know, don't sell the cow for any more of that, and all that kind of business. Whereas Myra's a bit more like, don't sell the cow for more. <laughs> um, so it's a certain, it's how you play the game, dame and how it's scripted. There are so many ways to play a dame. There's the Les Dawson way to play a dame, which is very obviously a man in a dress. Um, there is the draggier dames, uh, which some people don't like. There's the Danny LaRue, very glamorous dames, like it's Kerry Dupree who works today with what would be called a, a clothes horse dame. 
Um, so it's however, as long as you have a script that accommodates your performance and you have room to do it, it works. So Myra as Dame Trot worked. And as you said, somewhat, the person that said that said uh, they'd like to see Myra play Widow Twanky. I'd like to see Myra play Widow Twanky as well because Aladdin's my favorite pantomime. I was supposed to be in Aladdin last year. C'est la vie. Um, I think it needs to be a dame where they're involved in the story. So for example, Jack and the Beanstalk, uh, the mother is an important part of the story. Um, Aladdin, same. Uh, when we did Sleeping Beauty and Myra was Carabosse, the dame was the cook at the castle and had very little business uh, and that wouldn't have suited Myra. Whereas that villain, you'd have to do the same thing. Like if I, if, if I had Myra as a panto villain and she just stuck, stood next to the Brasemian March on the left talking in rhyme, that would be a waste of Myra as well. You'd have to adapt it. But that's the wonderful thing about pantomime. And what I love about pantomime is that it, it, you ca it is fluid. You can change it around. Um, let's see what you're saying. Everyone's saying... Uh, did alcohol ever impact your character as Myra? Was your what was was that part of your decision to quit drinking? I guess so. Um, the the line that most sober people will give you about why they stopped drinking is that their life became unmanageable, and that's what mine did. I I wasn't able. It, how like life started for me when I got sober. Um, so I guess uh, it did impact the character of Myra. I uh, you know it was just me in a costume getting drunk. Um, Aunt Baba G says, thanks so much for tonight. Myra's been a lockdown star. When times are tough, making people laugh is much needed. It's great to hear from the face behind the mask as it were. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I think your role in the Jamie movie will propel you further into the world of showbiz when it's eventually released before you've previously seen. Oh, had you seen the role? Seen the role? I'd auditioned for the show. <laughs> I auditioned for Hugo, but they said I was too young. They said I was too young for the part of Hugo which eventually went to Bianca Del Rio. And I'm so pleased they found someone more age appropriate for the role. Right, uh, more questions from this. How long did it take you to develop the appearance of Myra? Um, how many design, in terms of makeup, clothing, wigs and accessories, how many design changes, if any, has Myra gone through? It's impossible to say, it's changing all the time. I've settled into the one hairstyle for her now because that sort of helmet suits her. And I think like a Beano character, it's good to have some consistency that's the same every time you see her. So, but who knows? Who knows what the future will have? Um, let me see if there's any I've missed. Decision to do BGT, easy or hard? Um, if anyone's watching who um, is thinking about doing Britain's Got Talent, I would say go for it. Um, I had my reservations. Um, they know why I had my reservations because I'm not the first contestant to have those reservations. And I'm not the first contestant in last year's show to have those reservations. Uh, but I won't, not for me to name names, but um, people expect that in reality shows they're going to take advantage of you. That wasn't the case. They worked with me from beginning to end uh, and, uh, and I just let my feelings be known to them. I made, made my position very clear, let them know what my boundaries were and they were very respectful of those boundaries. So that was why I decided to go for it in the end. I trusted them with me and with Myra. So um, that was my, uh, that was my, reason for doing it and like I already said I wanted to sell tickets on the road and you know the dream is to be able to do my shows on the largest scale possible so it's just about exposure and how many people know about Myra and how many people will buy tickets to come and see the theatrical shows so you can pay everyone that's involved in them what advice what advice would you give to someone who has started out in working through a comedy persona let the character breathe, I would say. Uh, let the character come to you. Um, don't be too chained to your decisions. If something needs to change, it will. Like, uh, like I said, a lot of Myra's biography is in the back of my mind. One brilliant quote that I really love is from the Joker in Batman in a, uh, a graphic novel that I really love called The Killing Joke by Alan Moore. Uh, I think that's right. Geeks are going to fact check me on it. Um... 
there's a line where the Joker says, if I'm going to have a past, I'd rather it be multiple choice. And that's the approach I take with Myra. She will say things. Her dad has simultaneously died two years before she was born and died during childbirth. It doesn't matter. Just just let it breathe. And find out who the characters are. Like, just let them breathe. Spend time with them. Dress up as them at home. Walk around the house. Pull faces in the mirror. That's a good one for finding a character. And get a good pair of shoes. <laughs> Whatever shoes you want, that would uh, be. Christian C says, doing drag for a straight audience. How hard is that? It's hard to define, really. Um, how would you say straight audience? Would you, would you say just any audience that is away from the gay scene? Um, it's... There's a myth that it's easier to work gay venues than it is straight venues, and that's not true. I think some of the most disrespectful audiences that I've ever had have been in gay venues. I don't want to shit on people, especially while all the venues are closed. But quite often in certain gay venues that I, I don't work in anymore, not because I dislike those venues, it's just that the people that go to those venues want a different sort of act that I'm giving. You know, mine's all about character, it's all about the patter, it's all about the conversation, it's all about the jokes. They just want someone to sing Proud Mary four times. And that's fine. There's a place for that. But um, but it's not what I do. So I don't work those venues anymore. Whereas I will do the Edinburgh Fringe, for example, which is, I guess, a straight audience. And um, they're very respectful. They're there to be entertained. They shut up and listen. So I don't think... I don't think... I mean, maybe that's a question that's better some suited to someone who does drag brunches and who is in that world a little bit more than it is for me. Um, right, I think we should start bringing things to a close. Let's just let's just see if there's any... I've got so many questions, um, people coming through. Uh, let, let me answer all the questions we've got, and then I think we'll bring things... I think we're about 10 minutes from the end. Stay with me. Stay with me. Don't go towards the light, Caroline. James Masterman says, loved you supporting Bianca Del Rio R. It's where I discovered you. Do you enjoy working alongside other similar artists? Is there anyone in particular you would love to work with? I love working with people. This is why Frank's, um, Frank Lavender's next show is going to be a lineup show and I'm just picking people I want to work with who I haven't yet worked with um, because I, 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 I really thrive on that interpersonal connection sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, I loved working with Bianca. She is a scream, and she's one of the nicest people you'll ever meet as well, but she keeps that well under wraps. Uh, so, yeah, no, I, I, I loved working with her. Um, let me just, let me just read... Let me just read uh, how long does it take to do Myra's makeup nowadays. Oh, I can do it in, like, 20 minutes now. <laughs> Uh, Lucas, something I've always enjoyed about Myra is how she can be hilarious doing nothing. So like the cyclical jokes never getting to the punchline and the book reading by her, Myra Dubois, is that something you developed over time? Yes, yes it is, yeah. That's, uh, does Terry Pratchett inspire any of your humour? I guess you could say so, in that <coughs> Terry Pratchett's humour was very observed and so is mine. How lovely to be sat on camera talking about Terry Pratchett and I as if we are contemporaries. Um, but he says, uh, yeah, doing nothing, that just seems to be something I've got a knack at. I think it's part of being able to hold a room. So the, uh, like, for example, I know him so well, he's just Myra sat there for half of a song doing nothing. And it's just about having stage presence and command and knowing how to sort of sit so that people pay attention to you. It's the same as sort of like, like if we were in a room at a meeting and I sort of went like that, people would know, oh, it's, their turn to speak so um maybe that's um that's the thing uh gareth collins oh connor collins sorry what guidance of advice would you give to new performers about oh how much when to when to charge for a performance that's a good question um i would never i'd say have confidence in yourself but don't get too big for your boots <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're going to have to do a lot of gigs for free. That's why there aren't many working class people in the arts, because you have to work for free. When I say you have to, with the way the system is currently set up, you have to work a lot for free before you start getting paid. And so people that can't afford to give their time for free because they have jobs or other responsibilities are discouraged from entering the arts, comedy in particular, as we're talking at the moment. So, um... Yeah, that's that. It shouldn't be that way, uh, but it, it, it is currently that way. Um, but I'd say have confidence in yourself. Uh, don't drive prices down by agreeing to work for not very much money. Um, 
take pride in what you do uh you you are worth a fee you know so ask for it but at the same time that are for example i've just been on britain's got talent it would be so stupid of me to now go to gay bars and tell them that i expect two grand to go on stage because they don't have two grand so it's either do i want that gig or don't i want that gig you know what i mean so not that i can earn that kind of money anyway um oh my god all the questions are rolling in now i've said i'm finishing Okay, um, the questions are, how did you develop Myra's singing style? The Myra effect, real. I think it's a combination of, uh, Myra's singing voice is a combination of an extension of her laugh and uh, my own enjoyment of singing versus my own limited ability to sing. I can sing better than Myra can, which enables me to sing like Myra because I'm always in control of Myra's voice. I know how it, it sounds, but it's always at the pitch and the level and the notes that I want it to be on. Um, it just kind of evolved naturally over time. Um, there's a lot of Floster Florence Jenkins in Myra, um, I guess. I hope that, it, but it's true. Um, once it, There's a real alchemy. Actually, I think rather than Myra's singing style being addictive, it's the alchemy in picking the right song. Uh, for example, as soon as I started doing Why, I knew it was going to be, for want of a better phrase, a hit. So, because um, it was just making me laugh uh, and making other people laugh before I did it on stage. I just knew it was going to become a staple. Um, pe so pe the, the key elements in picking a song that's right for Myra are something that the audience are very familiar with. So you're subverting something that they know. Whenever I do a song that people don't know, even if it is right for Myra, for example, um, Jane County and the Electric Chairs, Fuck Off, which the, the lyrics are, if you don't want to fuck me, baby, baby, fuck off. If you don't want to fuck me, baby, baby, fuck off. Um, I ain't got time for yesterday's news, something, 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 something. Anyway, oh, this is another thing, Myra's thing for forgetting lyrics. Um, and when I did that song, people are just looking at me gone out, like they don't, and it is, I think it's a song that suits Myra, but people, so it needs to be a song people know, like Money, 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 like Why, like I Know Him So Well. It has to have something for the audience to join in with, like Money, 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 like I Know Him So Well, like Why, and it has to have a moment for screeching, like Money, 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 like Why, like I Know Him So Well. It's always got to have that ah bit in it. So, um... So yeah, that's kind of, it's it's more, it's not just how Myra sings, it's what she's singing that makes her version of a song so memorable, I think. Edinburgh Fringe 2021, what are the chances? None at all for me. I've made the decision not to go to Edinburgh because I want to concentrate on going to places like Manchester Pride and touring and just working, really. Uh, Ruben Corno, when you lose an audience, is there a particular gag that brings the house down every time? Don't know, Ruben. Never lost them. Colin Bell says, I know him so well is my favourite thing. I've seen a comedy act perform genius in the build-up of it. Thank you. That's not a question. That's praise. Most welcome. Um, Lavoir and Myra, sister or enemies? I did say at the top of this, I didn't want to get into slagging off acts. Um, I have a lot of respect for Lavoir. Uh, she's a fantastic performer and she looks stunning. I think people like to construct a narrative and pit people against each other and it's unfortunate really because whenever Lavoir and I talk um it's nothing but warmth and affection and respect for each other's crafts she messaged me after the Jane film to say congratulations on getting the part and I messaged her after doing BGT to say you know uh we're like fucking hell that's an experience isn't it Danny Beard as well so um yeah sisters then I guess to answer your uh, question um Ruben Connor, I oh, know we've said that one. Thank you for st sharing. Lovely. Let's see what you're saying on Quib Twitter. Oh my god. I think I think we'll be done in five minutes. Stay with me. Stay with me. I've, I've done that one. Peter, one key takeaway: it really is a process, changing, evolving, morphing, adapting. Yes, thank you, Peter. Um, someone's asked me that one already. Um, oh, it's people just saying thank you. That's okay. 
Uh, Michael B says, you've written Pantos. How much do you like writing long form projects and can we expect a book soon? Um, yes, I have been working on Myra's uh, autobiography. I also have another book in the works that should be released soon. Well, it should be announced soon. I've been working on this book for five damn years and no one is more frustrated than the publishers. <laughs> but it, it is coming. It's coming. I. Uh, it's nearly... Uh, so watch this space. I think we're done. I think we're done. Hey, listen, um, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Um, we've been going for an hour and a half. I think that's okay. Is there any in the... Yeah, people just saying thank you and bye. Okay, let's wrap it up there. Um, thank you for indulging me. This has been tremendous fun. I've gotten a lot of things off my chest, so this has been quite therapeutic for me. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm sorry if you've asked me a question and I've not seen it, maybe through email or something. Um, what I'll do after this is I'll go on Twitter and stay on Twitter. So if you want something, ask in. Also, um, if you are a performer and you ever want to know anything, drop me an email. I'm always uh, open to, to chatting to people. If I've got the time and the resource, please bear in mind we're going through a pandemic. And sometimes it's hard to get out of bed. But uh, thank you for doing this. Um, there are lots of announcements coming through. I've been working very hard uh, to get shows up and running. I'm doing shows at the Vauxhall Tavern, at the Clapham Ground, at the Eagle, at Via and uh, a UK tour. So uh, watch this space. In the meantime, thank you so much for indulging me. If you have any money and you would like to donate to the donate link, it would be most welcome. I was going to do this as a ticketed show, but I decided not to because not everyone is on the same income and I wanted this to be as accessible as possible to anyone that needed to see it. So if you are poor and you have no money and you're broke, I understand, don't feel the need to. However, if you've got a very comfortable office job and you would like to donate some money to the the link below. I will make sure it is given to Myra Dubois and her humanitarian fund to continue the work that she does. In the meantime, thank you very much for watching. Uh, take care of yourselves and I will see you very soon. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.